Software development is a highly opinionated profession. Have you been on Twitter, right? What's the best language? What's the best platform? What's the best framework? Mobile dev, web dev, even within mobile dev, you know, should you write native or cross platform? Are boot camps worth it, right? Everyone has an opinion and it could be daunting for someone new to this world. Well, you shouldn't listen to the vast majority of those opinions or advice. And here's why. There are so many different ways to have success as a software developer, and not only is every path to success different for each person, but even the definition of success is different, right? Maybe success to you is making the most money or working at a fang company and having that prestige. Maybe success to you is working at a small startup and having a lot of impact on that product and helping get it off the ground. Maybe success to you is launching your own product, being your own boss, working on whatever you want to work on when you want to work on it. Maybe success is being a digital nomad, a freelancer, traveling the world and working from coffee shops, you know, at some exotic location, right? Success is different for everyone. And this is a profession where you can find a situation that is very suitable to your interest, your strengths, your desires, your goals. And take me for example, I'm an Apple fan. I love to create well-designed consumer facing products that users like get to touch and use what I built. Like that's what attracts me to development. So being a native iOS developer really fits my strengths, my interests, my desires, my goals perfectly. If I were a web developer, working on APIs and databases. I wouldn't be very interested in it. Uh, I would probably suck at it. Web development would not be for me. It would not set me up for success. It doesn't matter if web developers make the most money or there's way more web developer jobs than iOS developer jobs. All of that is irrelevant for me, my interests, my strengths, my desires, my goals, right? Web development would not set me up for my definition of success. And that's the whole point. This is a very unique profession. So all these opinions and advice, you gotta think about where it's coming from. And I'm sure those giving the advice or the opinions have the best intentions. I'm not saying everybody's out there trying to misguide you, but remember their definition of success may be different. Their goals, their interests are probably very different. So just keep that all in mind. Let's talk about another type of question or advice that I see before I tell you who you actually should listen to, right? Because I've been telling you, don't listen to people. Well, there are people you should listen to. We'll get to that in a second, but let's talk about the what language should I learn? What platform should I go? What profession should I do? And you see those YouTube videos a lot, right? The best language for 2021 or the best software developer profession in 2021 or 2022, whatever. Those make me laugh, right? Because there's no way one person can answer that question with confidence. Now, aside from that, what's best is gonna be unique to everyone. Again, the whole you know definition of success, what your interests are, of course, that's gonna make the decision unique to you. But even on top of that, it's impossible for one person to know. For example, I've been a native iOS developer for about six or seven years now. That is all I have focused on. I have not spent any time on any other language, any other platform. I chose as my profession due to my interests and what I wanted to do to focus on this uh, platform, right? Swift iOS development. And even with that narrow focus, I feel like there's a vast ocean of knowledge in this iOS developer space, Swift space that I don't know yet. I feel like I'm barely scratching the surface. Now imagine if someone like myself is splitting their time between five different languages, you know, four different platforms. It's impossible to know and go deep and have that deep knowledge on every single one. There's just not enough hours in the day. And not to mention these platforms and technologies are constantly changing and evolving. So even if you were a specialist on a platform and a language three, four years ago, and maybe you spent five years, it's very likely that things have changed since you were in that world. So how one person can claim to answer that question, you know, what's the best language, you know, what's the best profession, web dev, mobile dev, whatever, how they can claim to give good advice with a straight face is beyond me. So what advice or opinions should you listen to? So this is a practice in sifting through all the noise and finding the signal, right? The good advice. And I recommend trying to find other developers that have done what you're trying to do and whose definition of success is close to yours. Again, using me as an example, if you want to be a native iOS developer working at early stage startups where you have a lot of impact, then yeah, you know, my advice is probably something you should consider. Do you wanna be a freelancer living the digital nomad life, traveling the world? Find a developer that's doing that successfully and go to them for advice. Do you wanna join a fang company and climb that corporate ladder? Find somebody that's done that. Do you wanna go out on your own, build your own product, maybe create your own startup? Find someone that's done that and reach out to them. 
The point is, if the person giving you advice or giving an opinion hasn't done what you're trying to do, or their definition of success doesn't closely relate to yours, be careful listening to them. I'm not going to say completely ignore them because there could be some little nuggets, but you know, maybe prioritize their advice a little lower than someone who's actually done what you're trying to do and whose definition of success is close to yours. And the last thing I want to mention, even if you find someone that has done what you were trying to do, take that as one data point. Because again, this is a highly unique profession. Maybe the path they took isn't quite right for you. So if you can find a handful of developers that have done what you're trying to do and whose definition of success matches yours, that is the best. Try to find that little group and then use all that as a whole, multiple data points to make the best decisions for you in your career, again, based on your strengths, your interests, et cetera. So hopefully this video will help you sift through all the noise and opinions out there about software development, help you get right to the signal, the valuable stuff, and make better decisions about your career. Don't worry about memorizing things, right? I think a lot of people think that they have to know how to build everything off the top of their head. They just go there and type, type, type. No, even the most senior developers Google the most basic stuff all the time. The key here, you gotta know where to find it, whether that's previous projects or you know where to go in the documentation, that's the name of the game. Know where to find it. Don't worry about memorizing. Number two, you got to learn how to learn, right? This industry is constantly evolving. Technology is constantly changing. The one thing that will be constant is that you're going to have to learn new stuff all the time in this career. So learn how you learn, whether you're an audio learner, you like to read books, you like to watch videos, figure out the best way you learn things and get really good at that because you're never going to stop learning in this career. And number three, sticking with the learning topic, repetition is key, right? You don't just learn one thing in programming and then you know it, right? You know it by doing it over and over and over and over again. Repetition is the key. Number four, don't fall into the tutorial trap. I think a lot of people when they're just learning, do this tutorial, do that tutorial. They just do endless tutorials. Your learning will really take a leap when you start building your own projects. When there's no cookie cutter recipe for you to follow, you gotta figure it out on your own. That's when you're gonna take the leap as a developer. Number five, and this will help you get out of that tutorial trap, is learn how to read the documentation for your language. I understand not every language's documentation is created equal. Some are great, some are not so great, but that's what you gotta work with. And knowing how to read the documentation, how to use the documentation as a resource, again, that gets you out of the tutorial trap. You're not relying on other people's tutorials. You can dive into the documentation and figure it out for yourself. That is a vital skill. Number six, this goes along the lines of once you're actually working on a project is learn to understand the cost benefit analysis of your work. A good way to think about that is each feature has like a spectrum of complexity, right? You may have an idea for a feature. There may be a super simple, easy to implement version of that. It may not be as robust as you want it, but again, you got to manage how much time it's going to take you to build it versus the benefits you're going to get. So along that spectrum of super simple, basic version to really complex, robust version, there's a whole spectrum of versions in the middle. So learning to balance that cost benefit analysis of the time you're putting into it uh, is key when you're building products. Number seven, let's talk about the am I a junior developer, mid-level developer, senior developer? When can I call myself what? I think that's an irrelevant question. Don't even worry about that. You could ask 10 different developers. You're probably going to get 10 different answers. It's very abstract, very vague. Stop wasting your time thinking about that. Number eight, find a mentor if you can, whether you have somebody in person that you met at a meetup or, you know, maybe build a relationship with somebody on Twitter. Finding a mentor early on can make or break your career. And along those lines, number nine, join Twitter. Uh, developers hang out on Twitter. It's where they talk and communicate. It's an amazing place to network, especially if you don't live in a development hub. But use this as to build relationships over time. Like I consider Twitter probably the most powerful tool in my developer career. Just the people I've met, the networking I've done. I've gotten job interviews for DMing people I know on Twitter. It's just, it's amazing. Build your Twitter, uh, join the community, be active, be known. It's one of the most important things in my opinion. Moving on to number 10, go to meetups if you can. I understand uh, you have to be in a bigger city to probably do this, um, and Twitter's a good backup if you're not, but if you can go to in-person meetups, so valuable. Your network is your net worth. I mean, so many career opportunities happen based on, oh, I met so-and-so at a meetup, and then I got a job. Like, it's just, it's real. It happens. Go to meetups if you can. Number 12 might be the most important on this list, and I genuinely believe in this, but if you're a junior developer, you have to create a very visual uh, portfolio website. You gotta showcase your work. And apparently, I don't know how to count. That was tip number 11, not number 12. Off by one errors, am I right? Anyway, tip number 12 is to create smaller portfolio projects. I believe you need to create a lot of smaller projects that can demonstrate a lot of different skills and showcase that on your portfolio. Don't get me wrong, there's value in shipping a full product, like actually completing it, but at the same time, 
If you do that, you may only have one. I think it's also good to show many different examples of what you can do. Moving on to tip number 13, that is your GitHub repo readmes. Make them visual. You know, put in pictures of the website or app you're working on. Uh, animated GIFs are even better to show in action, but it's it's pretty bad when you go to a GitHub repo, the readme is empty or if it's just a paragraph and then you got to dig in the code to figure out what it is. Having nice looking pictures or animated GIFs to see the project in action in the readme, awesome, do that. And number 14 is along those lines and just in general, but I think developers should have a basic level of design skills. I'm not saying you need to be a professional designer, but you should have some understanding of design, in my opinion, if you're making consumer products like apps or websites. All right, let's talk about some job stuff. Number 15, and this goes out to those that are trying to get that first developer job, because this is hard, I get it. But try to find the right fit, not the first offer for your first job. And I know like it, it's hard to get that first developer job. So the first offer you get is amazing. You're super pumped, like, hell yeah, I'll take anything. I'm gonna ask you to fight that a little bit because your very first job can either catapult you and launch you or hold you back because you learn bad habits and it's not a good experience. It can really make a difference in the direction of your career. Number 16 is along those lines uh, and it's maybe a controversial one. I'm sure I'll get some pushback in the comments, but take less money if you have to, if it's the right fit. Uh, just using some American, maybe San Francisco numbers for junior developers, say maybe a job is 75,000 one offer, but it's an amazing fit. And another offer is 90,000 a year, but it's kind of a crappy fit and doesn't look great. Like, yeah, you know, $15,000 a year is a decent amount of money and difference, but I'm telling you, it will compound over time to take the less money for the much better team, better product, better fit. That is going to outpace that extra 15 grand by a mile uh, in the long run. All right, number 17, and I may get some pushback for this as well, but I think you should spend an early chapter, and again, a chapter of your career in a major tech hub. You know, the San Francisco's, Austin's, London, uh, a big city with a lot of tech in it. And, you know, of course there's pros and cons with that. Usually those are very expensive, uh, but the network you're gonna get living in a tech hub is amazing and again, can compound over the whole course of your career. So I understand people may not wanna live in a large city like San Francisco, uh, cause it's expensive, but just do two, three, four years there and then move on. And just like I said, the network you're gonna get and take with you for the rest of your career, so worth it. Number 18 is a contracting freelancing kind of tip. I would do a full-time job first and start contracting and freelancing on the side as like a side hustle to kind of feel it out, get used to it before jumping in full-time. I think a lot of people want to start their careers as full-time remote contractors managing the project themselves. That is the dream. I understand why you'd want that. Again, for the long-term health of your career, I think it's very beneficial to start off at a company, do the contracting as a side hustle for a little bit, and then switch. Number 19 is just a general tip throughout your career, and that is show initiative. Um, show that you care about the project. So if you're a junior developer on a project and you wanna implement this one feature, go to your senior developer and say, hey, you know, I wanna implement this feature. I think it'd be really great. I put a lot of thought into it. I think we could do it this way, this way, this way. What do you think? Even if they turn you down, just showing the initiative uh, is going to be valuable and just apply that to like, all kinds of cases, again, throughout your whole career. Number 20 is another crazy important skill and just in life, and that is learn to communicate better. Uh, if you can, as an engineer, break down these complex engineering problems and explain that to either project managers or maybe the CEO if you're in a smaller startup and making them understand like why this is taking so long or the trade-offs between solution A and solution B. Being able to explain that to engineers is one thing. That's a, you gotta do that too. But being able to break it down into you know layman's terms for non-engineers and helping them understand, again, that will make you so valuable to your company. Number 21, again, when you're working on a team, just show that you care. And this kind of goes along with the showing the initiative, but we all know that person you work with or have worked with in the past that you can tell they're here for the nine to five job. They hate being here. They're just here for the paycheck. They don't care about what's going on. Like you've worked with that person. Hopefully you weren't that person, but don't be that person. Uh, Cause again, your reputation will follow you through your whole career. So if you are showing initiative, you show that you're passionate about your work, uh, that's gonna go a long way for your career. And along those lines, number 22, impress everywhere you go. Like I just mentioned, your reputation will follow you, especially if you're in a tech hub like San Francisco or any other city. It's a small community. Your reputation is a big deal. So at every stop, whether that's a contract or you know a company, do your best to put your best foot forward and impress people. Number 23 is a common misconception. You're not too old. 
I started learning how to code at 32 years old. I get questions from people all the time that are like 24 that think they're way too old. And I had this misconception as well. I thought you had to be a child math prodigy to be a computer programmer. That is not the case. And a lot of people are worried about like age discrimination in Silicon Valley. I don't see that. In fact, a lot of the engineers I work with are late 20s, early 30s, 40s. Like it's, it's, I think it's stereotypical to think it's for young people. It's really not. Number 24, another beneficial thing you can do for your career, if you can do it, this one's not for everybody, but that is to create content and build an online presence. That can be many things. Uh, that can be a blog, that can be a podcast, that can be YouTube videos. You can just have a, a great Instagram profile. Having an online presence and kind of being known within your developer community, whether that's Swift, JavaScript, uh, whatever, Android, having that online presence and being known, uh, hopefully known in a good way, uh, again, will benefit you. It's another way to network. Uh, you'll get a lot of opportunities if you become a known presence in your community. Number 25, if you're still learning or trying to get that first job, be patient. This is a long journey. So many people ask, how can I become a developer as fast as possible? That's the wrong attitude to have. This is a long journey, but I promise you it's worth it at the end. Number 26, let's talk about the 90-90 rule. Some people call it the 80-20 rule. This has been called many different things, but the point remains the same. When you're building software, there's the first 90% and then there's the second 90%. The first 90% is getting like most of the features done. It feels like it's so close to being done. The second 90% is all the air handling, the polish, you know, adjusting for different screen sizes. You think it's a lot of little nitpicky stuff, but it really adds up into being like the second 90% of the project. It's a lot and it really sneaks up on a lot of junior developers. Number 27, should you learn this language or that language? It doesn't really matter to be honest with you. If you do what you enjoy the most, my example, I enjoyed iOS development. I like the iPhone, so I wanted to build for that. If you do what you enjoy, uh, you're gonna become good at it, most likely. If you ever have to switch languages, learning that second language is infinitely easier than learning how to program for the first time. So switching later on down the line could be relatively easy if you have to do that. Number 28, let's talk about getting job interviews. Uh, don't go through the front door if you don't have to. What is, what is the front door? That is going to airbnb.com slash apply. Uh, that's very hard to break through that way. Again, back to networking on Twitter. If you start to get to know engineers at these companies, uh, build a relationship with them, DM them, say, hey, can you refer me for a job? Most likely they'll say yes. And that's pretty much a guaranteed interview. And then it's up to you. Number 29, when you're learning, I suggest completely immersing yourself, watching YouTube videos, subscribing to newsletters, subscribing to blogs, just completely soak up everything you can. And along with that, number 30, let's talk about podcasts. Podcasts are a great way to immerse yourself because you can multitask with podcasts. Uh, commuting to work, throw on a developer podcast. Going out for a walk, throw on a developer podcast. So podcasts are a great way to immerse yourself. Number 31, when it comes to getting contracts when you're ready, your personal and professional network will be the best. And by best, I mean getting opportunities, but also getting quality opportunities. Going on sites like Upwork, you never know what you're gonna get. You could get some really crappy projects, but if you're recommended uh, by a friend or a former coworker to another company, those are gonna be quality contracts. And that is how I've gotten all my contracts. Number 32, should you work at a small startup or a big company? As with any programming question, it depends. If you like to wear many hats, you consider yourself a generalist, you wanna build the whole app or the whole website, that's a small startup. Uh, if you wanna work on a very large team, on a large company and be very specialized, that's a big company. So your personal preference comes into play. Also, obviously the larger company, probably a larger paycheck, but maybe more stressful. Smaller startup, uh, smaller paycheck, could be less or more stressful, it depends. Number 33, preparing for job interviews, big tip. It takes months to prepare for these data structures and algorithms questions. Practice, 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 practice. What I've done in the past that has messed me up is two weeks before the interview, I'm like, okay, I'll start studying. That is not enough time. Give yourself a couple months, not a couple weeks. Number 34, remote work has its downsides, right? It's the dream to work wherever you want, whenever you want, remotely. Uh, that sounds like the dream, but, and it is fun for like six months. It's like the honeymoon period. After doing it for a year or two, it really starts to have its drawbacks, the loneliness, you're, you're by yourself most of the time, not working with people. And again, that may sound great, but after a long time of that, it starts to wear on you. Number 35, is a dev bootcamp worth it? Uh, what I have found, the knowledge you get, no, it's not worth that $10,000 potentially. However, forcing you to do it every day for eight to 10 hours for X amount of weeks, uh, getting the experience of working with other people, that is absolutely worth it. So uh, if you think you can be a good self-starter and learn on your own, I think you should probably save the 10 grand. However, if you like the extra push to force yourself to do it uh, for eight to 10 hours a day, I think a bootcamp is worth it. And number 36, after all these tips, 
it gets easier. Like experience in this industry matters, right? This may have been an overwhelming video throwing a lot at you. And I know you may be learning and it may feel overwhelming, but before you know it, you're going to wake up and five years has gone by and you're like, holy crap, I, I know a lot of stuff now. So it does get easier. Stick with it. I promise. Today, I want to talk about the biggest life lesson I learned from working in Silicon Valley as an iOS developer from 2014 to 2019. And later in the video, I'm going to share something about the founding of Instagram that illustrates this. And then we'll finish off the video with a quote from Steve Jobs that really drives the point home. So let's start with my misconception about developers, startup founders, you know, the people out in Silicon Valley that are building big things. And I think many people have this misconception, but you know, I think of like Google engineers, Apple engineers, successful startup founders, you know, I think like just geniuses, child prodigies, like, oh, I, I can never do that. And that's the big misconception because, you know, once you're out there, once you're working with developers, you start to know a lot of founders because let's face it, when you're in San Francisco, like everybody's involved in tech or a startup, you know, somehow. So, you know, a lot of people that are involved in this game and you just start to realize that like, of course, smart and talented, not taking anything away, but the mystique goes away. And you realize that like, you're just normal people, again, smart and talented, normal people, but it's like, no reason that I couldn't be doing big things and cool things like this, right? Like I see who they are, what they're doing, what they're achieving, and it just becomes a lot more attainable. Whereas before you're exposed to that world, it is that like mystique, godlike thing where you're like, oh man, I could never do that. And that just goes away once you're in that environment. And it applies to companies too. Like ask anybody that's worked at, you know, various startups or companies out in Silicon Valley, like from the outside looking in, it can seem like, wow, they're doing really cool stuff. It looks awesome, so successful. But once you work there and you kind of pull back the curtain, you kind of see how the sauce is made, you realize it's a bit of a shit show and that like people are just figuring it out as they go. It's kind of like the nature of building a startup in something new, right? Like nobody's done it before. So just by definition, you're figuring it out as you go. So I want to share something about the founding of Instagram. And this is an excerpt from the book, No Filter, about the story of Instagram. I'm not like plugging it. This is just relevant to what I'm talking about. But let's read it here real quick. By the age 25, Systrom had received an introduction to how growth-driven Facebook was, how scrappy Twitter was, and how procedural and academic Google was, right? He had worked there uh, before founding Instagram. Mind you, we're, we're talking like 2008, 2009 timeframe. So it's not like the tech of today. It's like a decade ago. But anyway, he was able to know their leaders and understand what drove them, which stripped them of their mystery. It's exactly what I was talking about. And again, here you go. From the outside, Silicon Valley looked like it was run by geniuses. From the inside, it was clear that everyone is vulnerable like he was and just figuring it out as they went along. Like I said, I experienced the exact same thing. And to, to finish this up, Systrom wasn't a nerd or a hacker or a quant, but he was perhaps no less qualified to be an entrepreneur. And that just kind of echoes like what I experienced as well. That's why I wanted to share that snippet. When I read that, I was like, holy shit, it's like exactly like how it is. And like I said, the biggest life lesson, the biggest switch was just why can't I build a great business? And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying like, why can't I build Apple, Instagram, you know, Google? Like those are of course crazy outliers. However, why can't I build a nice business for myself that leads me to have a, a great life and to where money's like not a problem? Why can't I build a business that gets acquired for 20, 30, 50 million? By the way, if you're familiar with Silicon Valley, those 20 to $50 million acquisitions happen all the time and they don't even make the news. It's like no big deal, run of the mill. Um, but to somebody like a, a $40 million acquisition, that's life changing. So that was the biggest switch for me is like, why there's no reason I can't do this. Again, people out there are very smart and talented. Don't, don't take this as I think they're dumb and anybody can do it. Again, the mystique just gets stripped away. That's the biggest lesson here is that they're just regular people. So again, with hard work, effort, smarts, talent, like you can do it too. And that's a very empowering idea. Like life changing is kind of cliche to say, but it did. It changed my life. Built a business around this YouTube channel. I'm creating a product now. I would have never had the, the gumption, right? Or the, the audacity to be like, yeah, of course I can do it without having that experience of working again in San Francisco and Silicon Valley and having that mystique being stripped. And I want to leave you with this interview excerpt from Steve Jobs, real short, but again, it really just sums all this up and really drives the point home. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is and you're your life is just to live your life inside the world. Try not to bash into the walls too much. Uh, uh, try to have a nice family life. Uh, have fun. Save a little money. Um, but life, th that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact. And that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people 
that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this, uh, th this uh, erroneous notion that life is, is there and you're just going to live in it, versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. Um, I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, uh, you'll want to change life and make it better because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. I believe the most common way to apply for jobs as a software developer is also the least effective way. And that's what I call going through the front door. So we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about what I think is the most efficient way. What I mean by going through the front door is you know, going to a website, clicking on careers, clicking on jobs, and applying and submitting your resume that way. And I think that's how most software developers apply for jobs. Now, I can't go into tremendous detail as to why this is bad because look, I've never worked in an HR department at a major company that sees all these resumes and applications coming in, so I can't speak to that. But I do know it's almost never worked out for me and all the other software developers I've talked about, it rarely works out for them. Like it's kind of common knowledge that this is probably the least effective way. And you know, your resume gets put in there, it gets through some scanner thing that picks out keywords and it's just, you know, who knows if you even get seen, right? So I highly recommend not going through the front door unless you absolutely have to. So what's another option? Believe it or not, Twitter. And I know some of you just clicked off the video right there, but hear me out. I see these tweets all the time. I'll put a bunch of them up on the screen where people that are doing the hiring are posting the job on Twitter. They're asking their network for retweets. I see this all the time. And I believe this is the most efficient way. Now, don't get me wrong. Some of those tweets, all they're tweeting is the link to that job posting that I told you not to do and you go fill that out. So if you're gonna run into that just as a warning. However, there are a lot where it's maybe the hiring manager themselves that are posting the job and say, hey, DM me if you're interested. So you can get a DM conversation going right with the hiring manager. Now, if you're a random person on Twitter, you might not have much to go on. However, if you have a great iOS developer portfolio, maybe a great personal website, or your GitHub uh, account is awesome, not just with cool repos, but your repos have good readmes they can check out that are very visual, very descriptive of what you built, right? Having an online presence, again, whether it's portfolio, website, really helps when getting job interviews through this method. Right, because you just DM them, say, hey, yes, I'm interested. You know, give a quick little introduction, click to your personal website or your developer portfolio. They're absolutely clicking that link and checking it out. And if that portfolio is impressive, you're gonna 100% get a, at least a phone screening, right? And the whole point of this is to actually get in the interview process. Once you're in the interview process, well, then it's up to you to impress and continue on. But you didn't go through the front door and get rejected right away. And I know it's crazy to think that like DMing people on Twitter is how you get jobs, but I've hired plenty of people that way. Here's the tweets where I've hired developers and I've seen it happen all the time. So if you're not active on Twitter, get active on Twitter, get involved in your community, have a great online presence. And when you see these job postings go up all the time on Twitter, you can act on it, jump on it. And it's a much more efficient way to get in the interview process than again, going through the front door, which is going to the website, going to careers, hitting apply. I just rarely heard that working out for anyone. It's, it's usually knowing somebody or, or this DM Twitter route that I've seen be very successful. So that's my recommendation. Uh, avoid going through the front door if you can. Do your best to network on Twitter. Keep an eye out for those DMs. Have a great online presence, a developer portfolio, personal website, great GitHub profile, that kind of stuff. Give them something to look at and be impressed with. And that is a much better way to get in the interview process. So first things first, you gotta be following people. So the first tip I'm giving is to follow event hashtags. Now, as a disclaimer, I am an iOS developer, so the examples I'm about to give are very iOS centric, but if you're a software developer in another field, you're gonna know what conferences are big for you, so just substitute those in place of these iOS ones. Now, the example I'm going to use is WWDC 2018. Now, for us iOS developers, uh, that is very timely as this is happening next week, starting June 4th. This is Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference. It's, it's kind of the Super Bowl for iOS developers. So definitely follow this hashtag all of next week, again, starting June 4th. 
And uh, the cool thing about this is as you're scrolling down and looking through the conversations, you can click into people's profiles and most of the time they'll you know, have what company they work for. Uh, if they have a blog, they'll have a link to their blog website or in their bio, they'll just be talking about you know, what, what kind of content they're putting out, if any, not all developers put out content. Um, so long story short, go through this list, follow the conversations. A, you're gonna learn a lot by following the conversation, but B, you can build the people you're following, build your list of iOS developers or whatever software language you're writing, and this will build your list on getting people to follow. So this is step one. So we're on to step two, and that is to uh, spread the word on good content. Now, as a content creator myself, I can relate. Uh, we spend a lot of time creating content. Now this is you know, YouTube videos, blog posts, podcasts, uh, anything, you name it. So, and, and I'm bad at this as well. So many times I've read like a great blog post that really provided a lot of value to me or just listened to an awesome podcast. So I was like, man, that was awesome. And then I just go about my day. I don't, I don't tell anyone else about it. I don't share it. So it's like, I feel like that content provider gave me a lot of value, but I didn't, you know, it's not a two way street. I didn't give them value. And the best way you can give these content creators value is to help spread the word about their content. And that is on Twitter via retweets. Now you could just press the retweet button and be done with it. But the better thing to do is to press the retweet button and then quote tweet, say a nice little blurb about the content, how it gave you value and use hashtags. The reason I say use hashtags is because uh, you may be saying, well, what, what good is it if I retweet? I only have, you know, 15 followers. What's that going to do? But if you attach the hashtags to it, specifically in the iOS world, you know, I, hashtag iOS dev, hashtag SwiftLang, uh, and then, or if it's during WWDC week, you know, do the hashtag WWDC 2018 or whatever conference is going on, if it's related to that conference. That will help amplify the message. And that is a great thank you to the content creators. And we notice, uh, for example, I only have, you know, a little over 3,000 Twitter followers. Typical big content creators in the space, around 10,000, that's probably where they're at, but even those are not big enough to, you know, you get lost. If you retweet their content with a quote, most likely they're gonna see it, they're gonna notice you, you know, they're gonna like the post, but more importantly, you're giving value to them. Like, that's how you build a network and build a relationship. It's, I provide value to you, you provide value to me. You know, in this case, they provided an awesome piece of content with a blog post, podcast, video, and you provide a value to them by helping amplify their content and, and get it out to as many people as possible. And as creators, like we really appreciate that. That's awesome. And we notice the people that are doing that and helping. And I'm just speaking for myself here, but like I said, I, I know the people in my community that, that always are retweeting and quoting my stuff and, and getting it out there. And if those people come and ever ask me a question, a coding question or about a career, like I'm gonna go above and beyond to answer that for them because I see the value they're providing me. And again, that's how you build these relationships. That's how you build your network. Moving on to step number three, that is get involved in the conversation. Now, I'll fully admit, this was my biggest mental hurdle that I had to get over when starting to use Twitter. And that is, especially once you start following a lot of developers, you'll see them in this conversation on Twitter and it feels a little rude or wrong to just like butt in with your opinion, um, but that's what Twitter's for. Like you kind of got to get over that. Um, now don't get me wrong, you have to you know, butt in with something intelligent or good to say. If you're just butting in with a thumbs up emoji or just saying nice, cool, and you're not really providing anything to the conversation, then maybe don't. But if you have something intelligent to say and can provide value to that conversation, absolutely jump in because the more quality interaction between two people on Twitter, the more that relationship builds over time, which is another point we'll get to in tip number five. Uh, so again, tip number three, jump into the conversation. Don't be afraid, but provide something intelligent, valuable. Uh, don't just kind of spam in there. Tip number four is don't be afraid to reach out to, uh, you know, developers you respect or content creators you respect and you respect their opinion. Reach out with some, a career advice question or uh, overall coding question. Now, I would avoid the really detailed, like, hey, I can't get this, I can't fix this bug, can you help me? And you just copy and paste a chunk of code in there. Try to avoid that, those are pretty hard to solve. But uh, just speaking for myself, like I love helping people. If it's something that I can answer in like a one to two, three minute response, like I'm gonna answer that 100% of the time. Especially if we, going back to the earlier steps, we, you know, you've provided me value by like helping spread my content or we've interacted on Twitter a lot. So we're starting to build that relationship. So I will go above and beyond for those people I'm starting to build a relationship because a network is a two way street. Yes, you wanna build the network with the people you're trying to build your network with, but I'm also building my network with you, right? So it's a two way street. So uh, that is one thing I wanna point out too is try to avoid being, always being the taker. Uh, in the relationship where like, it, again, just using myself as an example, if you interact with me and our only interactions are you just asking me questions over and over and over again, and there's never value coming back my way, like that's not a good relationship, right? Just remember the relationship is a two way street. 
And the last step, which I think is probably the most important, is be patient. Building your network takes months, years, right? Like I keep talking about these interactions and building these relationships with people on Twitter. Like you're not just gonna inter interact with somebody two times and say, cool, we got a relationship now. Like it's gonna happen again, months, years. And I just wanna preach again the value of your network. Don't also worry about networking up is what I'm trying to say. Like if you're just starting out, don't worry about trying to build your network of only people that are like senior developers, right? Uh, sure, they can help you, but also build your network of people at your level. Uh, that's going to help you learn. You guys can learn together. But at the same time, if you take the long-term approach to where uh, you know this is an investment in your career, building your network, who knows where you or the person uh, are going to be three, four years from now when you're starting out right now. And if you built that relationship from the beginning and then now you guys are off super successful, it's just gonna benefit you a lot. Today I'm gonna to walk you through my iOS developer resume that I just updated for 2021. Now, I don't claim to be a resume expert. I have used this resume at plenty of you know major tech companies all throughout Silicon Valley, got complimented a ton. So I wanted to share it and just, you know, give my reasonings, my explanation behind, you know, like why I did what I did. And hopefully you get some ideas or inspirations, you know, steal what you like, leave what you don't. Okay, we are gonna dive in like section by section and I'm gonna explain things, but let's talk about the overall look and feel first, right? Because this may not look like the traditional resume. And on that note, keep in mind, this is for like US job market. I completely understand that certain markets and certain cultures all around the world this may not be applicable, okay? So I wanna put out that disclaimer. However, I chose to do something like this because in my opinion, this shows good product sense. Let me explain, right? Like, I'm the product here, right? My resume, I'm applying for jobs, I'm the, the product, right? And to me, showing up with a resume like this, that's, you know, nicely put together, it's easy to read, very skimmable, easy on the eyes. You can get all the information very quickly. It's not just this giant wall of text that are hard to read. Trust me, I've hired, I've looked at hundreds of resumes. They all just blur together after a while and seeing something like this like really stands out. And again, back to like the product and user experience, right? You may know UI, UX from like just building your app, right? You want a great user experience. Well, User experience is everywhere, right? The reader of your resume is the user. So give them a good user experience. As you can see, I use different colors to like separate the sections. We have different font weights for good information hierarchy. The point is to make this very easy to skim, easy to read, easy to get the pertinent information very quickly and efficiently. And I get asked a ton like how I created this resume. So I'll show you real quick. I just built it in Sketch, right? The, uh, the UI platform here. And you can see kind of like, I keep my history, right? If we go back to the beginning, you can see the, the very first iteration of this. And it's kind of funny. Well, one, you can see Sean with hair, but if you know me now, I really like harp against this. Like I always bash people for doing this. I did it in the beginning, you know? So I always like to keep the history. Uh, I just kind of like copy and paste and then iterate and, and improve and evolve on it. But yeah, like I said, this is just in sketch, you know? So I can like move stuff around like this, whatever, uh, command Z. So a lot of people ask like how I did it. Uh, yeah, I just built it in sketch. It's not like some template I downloaded and just put my stuff in. This is like my own creativity, my own design work. Okay, so back to the resume, let's dive in section by section. I'll zoom in here, we'll start with the top. What you don't see here in the uh, upper left here is my address. I hid that for obvious reasons. But uh, you know, I included an image. Some people recommend against this, I, I don't know. I like to include it, I think it gives you know personality, it shows like who I am. If you don't wanna include a picture, don't include a picture. That's not a big deal. Uh, my name, you know, fitting in with the brand color scheme, there you go. And then I wanna talk about this section on the right because nowadays it's very easy to have like more than just a resume, right? Whether you have like a portfolio website, your Twitter account. I know a YouTube channel is a bit excessive. Not everybody's gonna have that. But this is kind of like the extensions of your resume. So it gives people a great place to look. For example, if they go to uh, my website, you know, cool, they can learn more about me here. Oh, he creates courses, cool, projects. I can you know, dive into each project, see where you work. So this is what I kind of like, oh, has a podcast. This is what I refer to as like the extension of your resume, right? And of course the YouTube channel, which you're watching right now, uh, your Twitter account, people will scroll that. So, you know, these are all like, again, extensions of the resume. And then I wanna talk about my, my sections here and like why I chose, cause I think that's the most important thing. Like not just telling you, here's what I did, but like, here's my thinking and here's like why I chose to show the information I did. So the about, again, I wanted to keep it very short and just 
give the high level information. Because remember, at the end of the day, like people read your resume and they want to like have a phone call with you. Like that's like the next step. So giving them a lot of uh, things to talk about or to dive deeper into, I think is a big part of the resume, right? Because again, as somebody who has done interviews before, it's very nice when people have a lot of interesting things on their resume and that can guide the conversation that we have and I can learn a lot more about them. So for example, I say six years experience. Uh, I spent most of my career leading iOS development for early stage startups in Silicon Valley. So that tells them like where I've basically spent most of my work. And then I'm looking to gain ex uh, to expand my skill set by working on a project that has scale. So I told them what I've done, what I'm looking for. And then, you know, just one sentence about the YouTube channel because that's very unique about me. And that's something you should try to strive for, you know, in the resume is like, what makes you unique? What makes you special? And you, you'll see me kind of come back to that. But yeah, so I run a YouTube channel educating tens of thousands of I, uh, on iOS development in Swift. Of course, you have the typical education, my degrees, you know, not in development. Uh, and then recent history, right? I want to like stress this. <laughs> At least this is my opinion. Again, if you disagree with anything I say, that's fine. I'm not going to like argue with you. But uh, I say recent because like the further you go back, like the less pertinent it is to like what you're doing now, especially for me, right? You meant if you know my story, I started coding in 2015 when I was 33 years old, right? So like if you look at my timeline down here, which we'll get to later, like, okay, I was doing all state insurance and I was in the Navy on submarines. Great, interesting talking points, but like has nothing to do with like my development history. So I didn't want to bog down this uh, recent history section with stuff that was irrelevant. However, I still included it again for the conversation points. So I would recommend if you're doing like a job history, like, you know, don't go all the way back to your high school job, you know, keep it, keep it to what's relevant, right? Uh, at least that's my, my thought process and why I chose to only share uh, my previous three developer jobs. And again, in my opinion, I wanted to give the high level of what I did so we can have a conversation about it further, right? So this is, you know, I ran my iOS development YouTube channel to educate people essentially. On the side, I ran a project to create a grocery order and fulfillment uh, app for a client, right? Just that sentence right there could lead to like a half hour conversation uh, with somebody. And then, you know, just again, keep it high level at Aluna. I just let all aspects of iOS development on the project. I was the only developer from creation to launch. Like just that sentence, I was the only uh, developer from creation to launch. Like the person knows that you, you did everything. You don't have to like list out like the stuff you did. You can leave it for a conversation. Uh, again, I continue to consult for Aluna to this day. And the reason I keep this high level and brief, again, is because I'm trying to surface the most interesting, the most pertinent information so they can quickly get a feel for who I am. I don't need to dive into the details and get into the weeds. That's like, that's where you lose people. You know, you've heard the famous kind of like saying that, you know, people just skim your resume for six to 10 seconds and that's it. So make it easily skimmable and very quick and efficient to get the uh, good information. So again, that's just more on the history. Let's talk about skills because I think this is uh, a little bit interesting and I may think about this differently, right? I didn't just list off a bunch of languages, Xcode, you know, the, the, the skills that all developers should have essentially, right? I wanted to focus on the stuff that again, made me unique. Like what makes Sean special, right? So that's kind of what I wanted to uh, say here in this skills section, right? So the reason I put Swift, even though that is a language, which I kind of just bashed a little bit ago, right? I wanted to basically basically say that like, I have my finger on the pulse. Like I know Swift, maybe not like an expert in the language, but right, right. I've been writing it for five plus years full time. I've been following its evolution since 1.0 pretty closely. You know, I run an educational YouTube channel teaching the fundamentals. I host a weekly YouTube show called Swift News discussing the latest topics. Again, the whole point of this paragraph is to portray, I don't even portray sounds like I'm faking it, but just to show that like, I'm in this world. Like I, I know what's going on in this world. And then the point of consumer facing is to express uh, to, like what I like about development. Cause to me, the most interesting thing about development is something I build, I create that was in my head, like watching somebody else use that, like that's awesome to me. So I'm big into like UI, UX, building the product, consumer facing stuff. So that's what I wanted to portray with this um, paragraph is to let them know like what I find most interesting about development. And then again, another thing that I feel is like, you know, unique to me, I mean, other people are good at communicating ideas, but kind of what, what is my strength, if you will. Uh, I have a special talent for breaking down complex topics and presenting them in an easy to understand manner. Uh, I get immense fulfillment from mentoring and teaching others. And another purpose to this is like, now that, you know, some of the jobs I'm looking at are more senior, more leadership positions, this is a much bigger deal for the senior, you know, leadership positions than it is for like the beginner ones. Even though this is still a big deal, no matter who you are, but it's just a much bigger deal when you may be like, you know, teaching and mentoring others on the team. 
And then the last little parts here, right? Side projects. Uh, I always recommend sharing this, like what, what you're doing. It doesn't even have to be developer related. I kind of kept mine developer related, but you know, I run my YouTube business. I run a podcast. I'm, you know, building my indie app creator view. Again, these can all lead to tons of discussion, right? I'm giving the interviewer a ton of stuff to talk about. Uh, other skills, you know, sketch and Photoshop, sales and marketing. I like the other skills to be something that can contribute to, you know, the position potentially, but aren't developer related, like sales and marketing, emotional intelligence. Again, as I'm going for more, you know, leadership positions. And then interest, like I said, I always recommend sharing something about you. Again, I've had interviews that started off with a discussion about Star Wars. You know, we talked for the first 15 minutes about Star Wars and that may seem like a waste of time, but you're also building rapport with your interviewer because at the end of the day, like, yes, people want to hire people they like, they like, or they genuinely share interests with, you know, you have to have the developer skills, of course, but there's also that, like, do I, do I like this person? Would I enjoy working with them? That's a big factor. So I always recommend sharing your interests because uh, most likely, especially if you share a bunch of them like I did, there's going to be some shared interest somewhere. And then lastly, the timeline at the bottom. Uh, this is a bit redundant, I'll admit, because like the final three on the right here, Brathometer, Independent Contractor, Luna. I guess I don't have Brathometer on this recent history, but it kind of mirrors that. Really what this timeline does is it gives a snapshot into like my whole life, if you will, right? Like, hey, right out of high school, I went into the Navy on submarines. Then I was, you know, all state insurance agent. Then I finally got, right? This tells a little bit of a story that again, the interviewer can dive in at. Like, I don't know, I can't tell you how many submarine conversations I've had, uh, on interviews based on this. Again, building rapport with the interviewer. Give them a lot to work with and you'll find the conversation will go uh, a lot better. Now, like I said earlier, just having a resume like is fine and all, but nowadays with the internet, websites, YouTube channels, Twitter accounts, all that, like it's great to have these extensions, you know, like your website or portfolio up here. So that wraps it up for the 2021 iOS dev resume. Again, take what you like, leave what you don't. I don't claim to be an expert. Just hopefully this gave you some ideas uh, to improve yours. When it comes to my technical skills, I'm an average developer. Like if there was a there was a normal distribution bell curve, I'd be parked right at the top of that thing, right? I'm not great, nothing special, but I'm not bad either. Just average. However, I think I'm a really good developer overall. And that's what we're going to talk about in this video cuz I want to maybe dispel some misconceptions that are out there. So like I said, my technical skills, they're fine, right? Nothing special, not bad, just just average. However, I think there's a misconception out there, I don't know, probably because I create content and put out a lot of stuff that I just know so much. And again, this is the misconception that I want, I want to dispel, right? Because I get DMs, emails, you know, comments on YouTube asking like very specific questions about all kinds of frameworks. And then as you know, like there's a whole ocean of knowledge that you can have. Like it's impossible to know everything about everything. And again, this is the misconception that I want to hopefully dispel in this video. The more experience I gain, the more I realize that like, I don't know much. And there's a difference between knowing something, like having it memorized versus being able to figure things out quickly and being a quick learner. And again, this is the misconception that I want to dispel because I know a lot of you out there are probably just learning software development or just learning Swift or you're earlier in your career and you're probably very self-conscious about your, your knowledge, right? You probably look at these developers on Twitter or content creators and you think to yourself like, wow, I don't, I don't know nearly as much as they do. And, and you're self-conscious about your knowledge. Well, again, I want to say that like, you don't have to know much, but there's a couple keys. Even if your knowledge is mediocre or less, there's some things you can do as a developer to make yourself really, really good. And I alluded to one of those just a little bit ago, and that is your ability to learn. Like I said, I don't know much off the top of my head, like AR kit, for example, I don't know anything about that. However, I'm confident if I were to get tasked with building an AR app, like I would dive into the documentation, I would read books. Like I'm very confident that I would be able to pick up that knowledge and skill set relatively quickly. And I think that's the big thing is learning how to learn whether you learn by reading books or watching videos or diving into documentation or listening to podcasts, like figure out how you learn because the ability to pick up new skills and new knowledge relatively quickly is a huge part of being a developer. You don't have to have every framework out there memorized. And besides learning how to pick things up quickly, there's a whole slew of soft skills that I believe are at least half of the equation, right? There's your technical skills and then there's your soft skills. And that's where even though I say my technical skills are average, I believe my soft skills are way, way, way above average. And that's what I think makes me a good developer overall, even though my technical skills, like I said, are just, they're fine, they're average. And those are skills that you can work on, right? Like your communication skills, like having the ability to break down complex technical topics, not only to maybe more junior developers or other technical people, 
but other non-technical people uh, at your company or on your team. For example, I spend a lot of time in small startups, so I'm constantly having to communicate to you know the CEO you know, the trade-offs uh, between how complex we want to make this feature, right? Because what happens with, you know, marketing and product people uh, or, or co-founders, like they want to add features, add features, add features. Well, it's up to you as a developer to properly communicate like, hey, that's fine. We can add this feature, but, you know, we're either going to have to get rid of another feature or make some trade-offs because we have a launch date that we got to hit. And if we keep adding features, like we're going to miss that launch date. And properly communicating that and having those discussions is an insanely valuable skill for a developer. And of course, the number one thing you can control is your work ethic, right? You can just be a hard worker. Back to that ability to pick things up quickly, you know, diving into books, learning new things, like that work ethic and that drive, like you can control that. You can, you can improve on that. And then other soft skills, like the, the passion you have for your job and your craft. Also being a good teammate, like it doesn't matter how great of a developer you are. If you're a horrible teammate and you're a horrible person, you're, you're bad to work with, like you're, you're going to be a net negative on your overall team, no matter how good your skills are. Another soft skill you can work on is showing an initiative, like, right? Like don't always wait and sit back and be told what to do. Now I'm not saying go rogue, but if you're a junior developer, like go to your senior developers or go to your team and say, Hey, I had this idea. I want to research it. I want to look into building this. What do you think? You know, and showing the initiative uh, will go a long way towards making yourself a more well-rounded developer. If you feel like you're lacking in your technical knowledge. And then of course you can start researching uh, UI, UX, design, overall product stuff. Again, cause this is, right, we're, we're talking about making up for a lack of technical knowledge. Well, again, there's a lot more that goes into being a developer than just knowing the code, right? Understanding, like I said, the UI, UX, the product, design, like start studying that, start getting very, very good at that. Cause again, that makes you more well-rounded. And then lastly, when it comes to getting that job or, or getting the next job or winning that contract, like the ability to market yourself is such a big deal and having a great online presence and developer portfolio really goes a long way with that. So again, I consider myself an average developer when it comes to just straight up technical skills. And if you feel that way too, or you feel self-conscious about your technical skills, of course you can still work to improve them. I'm not saying you have to know nothing and not work at that, but there's many other things you can do, like the soft skills we talked about and, and learning how to learn, learn how to pick up things very, very quickly uh, to kind of make yourself a more well-rounded developer. Right off the bat, you can see the number up here in the upper left, uh, right around 70,000. Uh, and there's a story behind that number, and that's really what we're going to talk about. The real whole reason I'm even doing this is because that is a, a modest number. And I say modest for, you know, here being in San Francisco. Uh, just the honest truth is, like, had I just really raked it in and made like 250 grand last year, I wouldn't be doing this video. <laughs> but because this is a relatively modest and like normal looking number, I'm fine, you know, showing this off. And like I said, there's a story behind this number that we're gonna get into. Real quick before we dive in though, one little pitfall of contracting, you can see this past due. So I still have, this is actually from November and I've been in contact with the client. Like I kind of get it. I told him he could wait a little bit. Um, but you know, sometimes you gotta deal with tracking down money over, you know, two months. So there's $743 that's still outstanding may or may not get it. I don't know, it's kind of the, uh, the pitfalls of contracting a little bit. Anyway, let's go ahead and scroll back to the chart here. So let's tell the story of how, how I got here, how I made that amount, that 70 grand, kind of the ups and downs of the contracting throughout the year. So again, like I alluded to in the intro, my story here is you can see uh, here in February. So real quick, this is the last 12 months uh, revenue. Because I'm doing this in January, this goes to January of 2018 and cuts off January of 2017. That's no big deal because January of 2017 was a zero. Uh, so like I said in the intro, uh, for January and February, I was working at my full-time startup job. So naturally those first two months of the year, I wasn't contracting, which again, like some of you may have looked and been like, wow, 70 grand in San Francisco. That's really not a lot. Again, this is just the contracting side of the story. You know, I was doing other stuff on the side to make money. Uh, my YouTube was making money, coaching, et cetera. And also the first two months out of the year, I worked at my full-time job, but there's a lot of like time off in this uh, time period too, which I knew I was getting into. And again, we'll tell the story here. So for January and February of 2017, full-time job, not contracting uh, in March of 2017 is when I decided to quit my job and just study for interviews and make the rounds. So I knew when I quit my job in March that I wasn't gonna have an income for a month or two while I found a job. It was fine, I had saved up money, I was willing to take on that cost. But it was during this time period, 
that if you've heard my, seen my video and I'll probably link it up about how I got my first contracts. This is when I got a contacted on my alumni, bootcamp alumni website to say, hey, anybody looking for some contracting work? And again, remember where I'm at in March, I'm like, okay, I, I don't have a job right now. Let, let's take on a small contract, get, get some income, uh, kind of buy me more time to find a job. That was my whole attitude. My attitude wasn't, let me go contracting full time. So here we are in March, uh, I made you know about $1,500. That was that small contract that we were talking about uh, and that was it. I didn't, again, I didn't intend on my year. So basically from March, April and May, I was still interviewing pretty much full time. Contracting was just a small thing on the side to just kind of supplement my income while I was job searching, right? It wasn't like I'm going full time contracting. So again, if you heard my contracting story in the previous video uh, that I linked up, uh, you know that I started with my agency with a very small contract. They liked what I did. And then we moved up to a bigger contract. So you see, I made about 3,700 that month. And again, I'm still interviewing full time. This is still like side income. And then uh, they put me on another project after that because they, they kept liking what I did. And this is around May is when my interviews kind of started to die down. Like I kind of like, <laughs> I'm giving up a strong word, but kind of said like, hey, let, let me, you know, maybe think about contracting full time. You know, these interviews aren't working out. Um, so I did a lot of contracting work in May and made about eight grand that month. So that was a pretty good month. Now, here's where uh, we talk about the feast or famine in contracting. So I finished up these kind of little mini contracts in May that did well. And then with my development agency, they said, hey, we got a big project coming down the pipeline. We want you to do it. You're building it from scratch. It'll be pretty much 100% your app. You build it. I'm like, sweet. The catch was uh, it's not going to start for another three to four weeks. <laughs> so I didn't go out and like find other contract work because I knew I was pretty much having like a 40 hour week contract coming up in three weeks. So I couldn't go like find something small. So this is another pitfall of contracting is that I just didn't work for three weeks. Luckily it timed up as you can see here between May and June, it kind of timed up with, uh, I took a trip home over Memorial day weekend, spent some time at home. So it, the timing kind of worked out nicely. You know, I, I didn't have much work to do then. So again, small stuff here. I only made about 1800 in June, but you can see like that's pretty big fluctuation you know, eight grand in May to, you know, 1800 in, in June. So, when you're contracting, you know, you can't be living like paycheck to paycheck. You have to have an amount saved up because, you know, you could have a down month where you hardly make anything. So, but right, right around here in June is when I said, all right, we're going to give this contracting thing a full time go. So like those interviews didn't work out. So again, when we go back to this, you know, 70,000 number, just keep in mind that I was doing it basically part time for the first six months of the year. It wasn't until June uh, that I decided to say, you know what, for the rest of the year, I'm going to be a contractor. And I started to f try to find more contracts. And that's what you can see happen here in July. You know, we got back up to 5,200 as my contract started to kick in. Here in August, now we're like full-time contracting. Uh, if you if you watch my vlogs, you know that I was doing like 40 to 50 hours a week at this point. Uh, and I still have like YouTube and coaching and stuff on the side. So you can see here through August to September, we were about, you know, roughly 11.5 through those two months. And this is... Again, you guys know my rate. Well, if you've been following the channel, you know my rate was uh, $70 an hour for 2017. I'm gonna up it for 2018 if I stay contracting. But so and I was doing like 40 to 50 hours a week roughly here. And then my, my hours dipped a little bit as I finished up one major project, but we're still, you know, about 8,000 this month. And then that was steady through November and December, but I pretty much didn't. So this December number of 8,000 was carry over from November because I pretty much haven't worked the entire month of December. I knew I had a big contract coming similar to this period here, where it's like, okay, I know in three to four weeks, I have this major full-time contract coming. So, you know, I can't really do anything in between. So I guess I'll just chill till that happens. So this time period here is exactly what's hap what happened for the month of December, which is why th this huge dip off is because like, I literally maybe worked 10 hours the entire month of December, which was nice because I, I did some traveling, it was the holidays, it was a nice break, uh, you know, after this kind of crazy run of going pretty hard. But now here at the end of December, actually just January 1st, our new contract just kicked in that's gonna last me through March. And that's like a 40 to 50 hour uh, week contract. So we'll be back up here for the first couple months of uh, 2018. But then, uh, like you guys know, I'm looking for a full-time job. Now, don't get me wrong, there, there's pretty good money. Like I said, if I didn't decide to go full-time until like six months in, around June, had I been like, you know, right now, if, if I were to carry this over in 2018, I'm fairly confident I, all my months would look like this, maybe even more because I, I plan on raising my rate. So it, contracting is pretty lucrative, but and it's, it's a lot of hard work and there's a lot of like unknowns involved. Like if you can line up the contracts, it's great. You can see the type of money you can make. Uh, however, if you're kind of intermittent between your contracts, I mean, you can see you can go like whole months without making any money. So 
it's a different lifestyle. One of the main reasons I'm looking for a full-time job, uh, you know, a there's a whole like I want experience working on a major app and a major team at a major company. I just want that experience in my uh, you know repertoire. But another thing is like I, the stability is nice to not have to worry about trying to always find that next contract. You know, and always kind of stressed. Uh, like right now, it's like I know I'm good through March, but after March. I have no idea. So, uh, you know, if I don't land a full-time job, so just kind of getting rid of that stress and getting that stability. But, uh, I just want to point out again, my rate was $70 an hour through 2017, going to up it in 2018, but, uh, you can kind of see the, the peaks and valleys, the ups and downs. Again, this good stretch is when I was doing 40, I was on like four different contracts, 40, 50 hours a week. It's a pretty stressful time, but you know, you get, you got paid for it. And then you can see there's definitely dips where like, you're not working at all for a couple weeks. And that also shows in your revenue. So this is an update I did to a video about two years ago where I discussed my contracting rate. You can see that here. Link will be in the description if you want the context of the full journey of my contracting rate. But, you know, it's been two years since that video. Uh, you know, my contracting rate has gone up quite a bit. And I want to talk about, you know, how I went from there to here. So let's go. Before we dive in, let's start with a disclaimer, right? I just want to share my experience, what, what I'm doing, my information. This is not meant to be a here's what your contracting rate should be at four years experience, right? Every situation is different depending on, you know, what country you live in, what your market is like. Are you contracting on the side just for side income? Are you contracting to pay the rent? So like finding projects is like imperative. Like all these come into play in like what rate you should charge. And if with me anyway, my rate can kind of fluctuate, right? If I really want the project, like it's super fun or maybe I just need the money, I'm willing to like knock my rate down a little bit to make sure I get that contract. Or the opposite side of that, you know, the situation I'm in now where I'm doing YouTube kind of full time, I have a consulting gig, I'm not really looking for a ton of contracts. So I can be picky. I can say, this is my rate, take it or leave it, right? I, it's kind of a supply and demand thing. So again, I just want to point out, there's a lot of factors at play when determining your rate. So now that that's out of the way, like let's get to what you're here for, right? Let's talk about the number. My current contracting rate is $125 an hour. Now let me give you some career context real quick. I'll give you my life story here. Uh, I have about four years experience in iOS development. Uh, I spent five years in Silicon Valley working at startups. Four of those years were developing at startups, building you know MVPs, all that stuff. I've probably worked on or built about 10 production apps between all the various contracting I've done and the various startups I've worked at. So that's a quick career context. And then another thing that I have going for me that is unique, and again, I want you to just use me as one data point, not the instruction book on how to do this, right? Is I do have this YouTube channel and the Twitter following, which is amazing marketing for getting contracts, right? I get emails about contracts all the time. I have to turn down 90% of them, right? So take that with a grain of salt because like I can kind of afford to be like, you know, raise my rate because again, it's all about supply and demand. Um, maybe the little takeaway you can take from there is, you know, start a blog, start a YouTube channel, start a podcast. Having an online presence for marketing definitely helps. And the way I'm going about my rate is I am raising it every time I negotiate a new contract. I'm trying to find my breaking point. If you watched the last video I posted when I was charging 70 an hour, I said nobody ever batted an eye at it. So like I'm probably charging less. So what I started doing was every new contract, I was like, okay, now my rate's 85. Nobody batted an eye. Okay, now it's 100. <laughs> nobody batted an eye. Now it's 125. Again, nobody batted an eye. And then finally, just recently, probably in the last month, I was negotiating a contract and I said 150, and I finally got the first pushback where they kind of pushed me back down to 125. I didn't end up like doing that contract because it was too time consuming. Um, but that was the first pushback I got was at 150. So maybe that's a lesson, you know, whatever your number is, right? Everybody's number is going to be different. Anytime you negotiate a new contract, keep trying to bump that up until you find like the breaking point. And a quick note on that, right? Just because one person says no, doesn't necessarily mean your price is way too high. Wait till you get a couple no's before you start saying, okay, I've found my market rate. But like I said, my rate can fluctuate. Like I said, if I really want to work with the team, you know, I'll lower it. And again, vice versa, if it's like a contract I, I don't really want, maybe I'll throw out a high rate. And if they say yes, like, great. So that's kind of the main point here. Uh, again, just wanted to share my information. Again, one data point. Don't take this as a, as a how-to, um, but hopefully you had some takeaways from this. That is my contracting rate currently, $125 an hour. But again, every new contract I get, I'm going to try to bump it up and, and see what happens. Knowing when, why, and, and even how to say no is such a valuable skill as a developer, but it is a bit of an art form because there's so many various contexts and situation where this could apply. You know, a couple examples, right? Are you a freelancer 
that's working with a non-technical client and they don't understand how development works. Well, that's a completely different situation than if you're working on a large development team at a large company, or maybe you're just a solo developer working with the CEO of a startup and you have to have conversations with them, or hell, even if you're an indie developer and you have to say no to yourself, right? Because as indie developers, we want to build all these features. Well, if you ever want to ship, you're gonna have to say no to a lot of features. So again, knowing when, why, how to say no, so powerful and so essential as a developer. So the gift and the curse of being a developer is that we can build pretty much anything, right? On an infinite timeline, infinite budget, you know, we can figure out pretty much anything. Um, but as you know, we never have an infinite timeline. We never have an infinite budget. In fact, most times the budget is really tight and the timeline is really tight. So that's why saying no uh, is, is a huge thing. However, on that note, I wanna be clear that saying no isn't like crossing your arms and saying, I'm not gonna do this. No, oftentimes saying no is a compromise because oftentimes the requested features are a lot more than you can build within the timeline and within the budget. So uh, this compromise I like to talk about is this spectrum of complexity that I've mentioned in, in my previous videos. And a feature has a spectrum of complexity, meaning you can build this insanely robust feature, but it's gonna take a very long time but there's also a version of that feature that's the quick down and dirty and you can probably knock it out in a day or two. It's not gonna have all the robustness of the fully robust version, but you know, there's two different versions and I call the spectrum of complexity everything in between, right? And you know, you can land somewhere on that spectrum as part of the compromise of saying no to the fully robust feature because you just don't have the time or the money, but landing on some feature that makes the client, the, your manager, whoever happy. Saying no or working on that compromise we just talked about uh, also helps out because it reduces a lot of feature creep. If you've ever worked at a company or worked for a client, you know you hear this all the time. Oh, hey, can we add this little extra thing in here? Can we add this little extra feature? And on the surface, that one little extra thing or extra feature isn't a lot, but those things start to add up. That's why it's called feature creep. And before you know it, you're turning out like half-ass features, half-ass products because you've taken on so much. You said yes too many times that now you're just overworked and you don't have enough time or you don't have enough budget. And that's never a good thing. And this art of saying no, it definitely comes with experience. I remember when I first started development, I did. I said yes to everything because I wanted to prove that, yeah, I can do this. I'll, I'll work day and night, I'll do this. And it's just a bad spot to be in because like I just said, you start over promising and under delivering and now that starts to, to look poorly on you. Like you don't know what you're doing because you can never deliver on time. It's because you're saying yes to everything. So if you're a junior developer or just getting started in this world, like I completely understand the desire <laughs> to say yes to everything. Um, but just keep that in mind. It's gonna do you more harm than good. And let's talk about like how you can say no because you're probably wondering like, who am I? I'm just the new person on the team. I can't just say no to features, right? They're, they're telling me what to do. My manager's telling me to do this. So there's definitely, uh, you know, when I say say no, that's kind of high hyperbole, it's again, back to that compromise and, and how you do it is very important. And it often involves just having a reasonable and rational reason and discussion. Again, oftentimes it's, it's marketing or a product manager or the CEO of a smaller startup, or maybe you're freelancing and it's a client that, you know, may not fully understand how development works and why it takes so long. The key here is your communication skills. This is where this comes in is having a conversation and breaking it down like reasonably and rationally. Like, yes, I know this idea is great. You know, if we had more time and more money or maybe another developer, maybe a bigger team, you know, yes, we could build this out, but you know what? I am just one developer at this small startup or freelancer or whatever. You know, we just don't have the time or the resources. Maybe we can do a lesser version of that feature that I can, you know, deliver on time. And from what I've seen in my career, again, at smaller startups, uh, independent contracting, indie developer, uh, cause I understand if you work at Google, you may not have the ability to say no or compromise, right? You know, you have a much higher level of hierarchy uh, to deal with at these larger companies. So just for the context, but you know, th this marketing team or the product manager or the CEO of a small startup or, or your client, you know, they have the best intentions. They just might not, you know, realize what they're asking for, right? Cause on the outside looking in, oh, it's just a simple screen. Doesn't look that complicated. You could probably knock that out in a day or two. And they just don't realize that, you know, your, your code base has roots, right? And everything's all tied together. So what may seem simple on the surface, it's actually a pretty complex uh, operation. And again, this is where your communication skills come in to sit them down, talk them through it. Uh, not only will your developer life be easier, but your actual relationships with your teammates will be much better because you took the time to sit them down and explain and, and compromise on the idea. Like they were part of the process, right? You definitely don't want to be just the developer folding their arms and saying, you know, 
no, I'm not going to do this. Like, do not come off with that attitude. Even though I'll admit sometimes in my head, when, when somebody asks for a feature like that in my head, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I never say that, you know, we, I, I go through it and I, again, break it down rationally and reasonably on like why it's not a good idea to, to do this or, or what kind of compromise. And what I found helpful is don't make them feel like their idea is a bad idea or wrong. Like it can often be a great idea, but one part about being a developer, especially at smaller companies, is you have to triage all the good ideas because you can only work on like one thing at a time. So, you know, you can say, hey, like this is a great idea. However, we're prioritizing A, B, and C first, and then we'll get to your idea D. But in the meantime, maybe we can build a, a lesser version of that, right? So again, you don't want to make them feel like you just shut them down, right? But explaining that, we'll understand that, okay, yeah, we do have bigger priorities in this idea. Cool. And they just get it. And again, your, your team is working much better together. Your life as a developer is much easier, all from saying no and compromising on something. And another thing to keep in mind is that a no isn't forever, right? Just because you said no now doesn't mean that feature can't come in, you know, in a later version, a couple months from now, or maybe even a year from now, right? Software is never finished. So the lesson here is that saying no or compromising on features is a very powerful skill set to have in your developer toolbox. And it really boils down to your communication skills on how you do it. Again, a reasonable and rational explanation, work with your team, communicate, right? Those communication skills. And I know as a junior developer, you're, you just want to say yes to everything, or you think saying no is going to make you look bad, like you don't want to do any work. No, that's again, that's why you explain your rationale. But just trust me, if you say yes to everything, you're going to be overworked, you're going to overpromise and underdeliver and it's just only gonna look bad on you. Uh, I learned it the hard way, trust me. Saying no is so powerful.